Romans chapter 11, verses 22 through 23. <coughs> Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Thank you, Daniel, for the scripture reading, and Brother Langley for the prayer, Brother Philip, and leading these beautiful songs today. Indeed, it is a privilege and a blessing to be here on the Lord's Day, to worship Him in spirit and in truth, and doing all the acts of worship that He has authorized and prescribed. We sometimes hear the expression, have you heard this, God is good all the time. Have you heard that? I hear that quite often, and I agree that God is good. He's exceedingly good. He is good beyond our greatest comprehension and imagination. God's goodness is so wonderful. But I'm afraid that many times people emphasize the goodness of God to the neglect of His severity. We also need to understand that God is a God who is severe, that He is exceedingly strict and severe. As great as His goodness is, so great also is His severity. We need to consider both. In Psalm 7 and verse number 11, God judgeth the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. But the way some people think, you would get the idea that God is never angry at anybody about anything. Yes, God is very good. In Psalm 31, verse 19, Great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before sons of men. So we must fear and reverence God and trust him. And, of course, implied there is obedience if we are to be the happy recipients of his great goodness. In Psalm 63, in verse 3, Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. God's loving kindness is better than life. One of the great statements regarding the goodness of God is in Psalm 86, in verse 5. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Indeed, God is plenteous in mercy. In Psalm 107, four times this expression is, oh that, God, oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. In Psalm 107, verses 8, 15, 21, and 31. My friends, God is exceedingly good, and we need to understand that. Consider an Old Testament example, though, of God's severity. In Leviticus 10, 1 and 2, When Nadab and Abihu, sons of Aaron, offered strange fire before the Lord, he consumed them with fire, and he destroyed them. The fire that they offered was not authorized. It was that which he commanded them not, the Bible says. And God consumed them with fire. We might think, well, God wasn't like that in the Old Testament. Oh, is that so? Do you remember when Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5, verse 1 to 9 in that context sold land and they went and gave it to the church, leaving the impression that they gave the entire price of the land to the church and God smote them with death? Peter said to Sapphira, after her husband had already been put to death three hours earlier, how is it that ye have agree, agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? 
the sin was not in the fact they didn't give it all. The sin was in that they intended to leave the impression they were given the entire price, but they were not. These are just two examples of God's severity. There are many others that we could consider. God has something here in our lesson text that He wants us to behold. That is to regard, to consider, and to contemplate in Romans 11, 22. Behold therefore the goodness and the severity of God. If we behold the one or consider one of those qualities of God to the neglect of the other, our view of God will be one-sided. For our own benefit, God wants us to behold and to consider both the goodness and the severity of God. In 1 Peter 3 and 12, we have examples of God's goodness and severity. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and His ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Just think about how many people in the world today that God's face is against. There are many. Many who have never obeyed the gospel. Many who are defiant toward God and irreverent. And many members of the church that are not faithful. Many, many people have God's face against them. But for those who are faithful and righteous, the eyes of the Lord are watching over them. And His ears are open unto their prayers. Isn't that encouraging and consoling? To know that God is with us, that He is for us, that He is watching over us and open to our prayers if we are faithful. First of all, let's say a bit more about the goodness of God. The goodness of God entails His loving kindness. From the Hebrew word in the Old Testament, chesed, it means kindness, favor, good, Godliness, goodliness rather, kindly, loving, kindness, merciful, and mercy and pity according to Strong. And we have many examples of that we've just read from the book of Psalms. In the Old Testament, in the New Testament also, we have God's goodness expressed. In Titus 3, beginning at verse number 4, But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appear, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of re regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He set on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. That is, our righteousness and our supposed goodness did not initiate this plan to save man. We didn't deserve it. God brought forth through His kindness and mercy and love and goodness, salvation to man. For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us, Titus 2, 11 and 12 says. God's plan is a wonderful example of His grace and His goodness. Also in the book of Romans, the fifth chapter beginning at verse 6, it speaks of our undeservingness and what God and Christ have done for, for us because of their great love. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Earlier here in the book of Romans, in the second chapter, verse 4, Paul declares that the goodness of God leads man to repent. At least it should do so, although some will not repent, even in view of all of God's great goodness toward us. In Romans chapter 2, verse 4, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But also the severity of God should lead us to repentance. Paul, writing to the church of Corinth, said, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. 2 Corinthians 5 11. How many people have we seen go before the Lord in the church 
to obey the gospel or to be restored upon hearing a powerful lesson about the lake of fire and brimstone and hell. Many people. Yes, fear is a motivator as well as love. Now, I'd like to look at in more detail now the severity of God as we turn our Bibles to Romans 11th chapter verses 22 and 23. <laughs> Paul says to the Christians at Rome, Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, that is the Jews, who were in unbelief and disobedience to God, but toward the goodness, that is the Gentiles, who obey the gospel. If, there's a condition, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. Otherwise, you will be like the Jews. If you go into unbelief and disobedience, you will be cut off from God. In verse 23, And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, referring to the Jews, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Now, we, of course, want to say more about this in just a little while. Now, I want to go back to Romans 2, verses 5 through 11. Here, Paul speaks of both the goodness and the severity of God as we read beginning at verse 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, that is a heart that will not repent, treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, that's God's severity who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. That's God's goodness. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish, upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. That's God's severity. Verse 10, But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also the Gentile. That's the goodness of God. Verse 11, For there is no respect of persons with God. Now I would like to, at this time, read a comment by Brother R. L. Whiteside in his excellent commentary in the book of Romans. I'd like to, first of all, read Romans 11, 22, and 23 again in the American Standard Version, and then read his comments. Paul says, Behold then the goodness and severity of God toward them that fell severity, but toward thee God's goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. And they also, if they continue not in their unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Brother Whiteside states, This saying, this saving some through faith and cutting off others because of their unbelief, shows both the mercy and justice of God, both the goodness and severity of God. And this leads Paul to exclaim, Behold then the goodness and severity of God. God dealt severely with the Jews because they fell through unbelief. His goodness would be extended to the Gentile Christians so long as they did not fall through unbelief. In His goodness and in His severity, God is neither tyrannical nor whimsical. The display of either His goodness or severity depends on man's attitude toward Him. Let us not get a one-sided view of God. God is love, 1 John 4, verse 8. It is equally true that our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, verse 29. Because of unbelief, the Jews had been cut off from God's favor. Their only hope, therefore, was to come back to God through faith in Christ. Any among them could be grafted in again into God's favor if they continued not in their unbelief. God was able to graft them in again. The only hindering cause was their unbelief. We have an example of this principle of being cut off because of unfaithfulness, which is here described by Jesus as not bearing fruit in John 15 and verse 2. 
The Lord said, every branch in me, that is in me the, the vine, my followers are branches, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Then down in verse number 6, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. This being also an example of severity. Now, I'd like to go to the book of Hebrews, the 10th chapter, beginning at verse 28, and read of those who become apostate, who fall away from God, and of course, we have people today say, well, once in grace, always in grace. And once saved, always saved. You cannot fall from grace. We know that Paul warned the Galatians against falling from grace, didn't he? Galatians 5, 4. And even here in Romans 11, verse 22, the danger of one being cut off because of unbelief and disobedience. One can fall from grace. If one did not belong to God in the first place, how could he be cut off? So that nullifies the argument, well, if you, uh, if you fall away or go into sin, you never knew the Lord in the first place. I'll say a bit more about that in just a moment. Let's look at Hebrews 10, beginning at verse 28. I would encourage us to read along here in Hebrews 10, beginning at verse 28. The inspired writer says, <clears throat> He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye, sore punishment, so much for the idea then that God was a different God in the Old Testament, the sum of her, or that God was more severe back there. Here the writer says more sore punishment, more severe and harsh punishment for those who apostatize from Jesus Christ. But let me read. Of, of how much sore punishment suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who hath trod underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. I want to pause there for a moment. Those who argue, well, if you fall from the Lord, or you go into sin, that just shows you never loved the Lord in the first place. I've heard people say, well, I cannot fall out of love for my Lord. In other words, I can't go against my Lord once I'm saved. You ever heard people talk like that? Or, well, if you become sinful, then you never knew the Lord in the first place. You were never saved in the first place. But look at this verse here in Hebrews 10, 29. It speaks about the one who cast the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. Now, to be sanctified means to be saved. It means that one has become right with God in the state of sanctification, set apart unto God, sanctified by the truth. John 17, verse 17. Now, if one was sanctified, doesn't that prove that he was saved in the first place? It's like a man up on a ladder. If a man falls off the ladder, what do you deduce from that? Well, he was on the ladder in the first place. One cannot fall off of a ladder that he never stood upon. In like manner, one cannot count the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing if he was never sanctified. Now, he may disdain the blood of Christ, which is what he's talking about here for sure, but he cannot be one who once was sanctified in this particular case if he never obeyed the gospel. This is talking about people who have, in fact, known and obeyed the gospel. Now let's read further, verses 30 and 31 here in Hebrews 10. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Remember, friends, this maybe is on another line here, but think about it. It's not up to us to take vengeance. If we do, then we're trying to take that which belongs to the Lord. If we try to get people back, and repay them for what they've done to us. The Lord said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. It's unto God to execute vengeance, not you and me. Well, let's read further in verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 
Does that speak of severity or not? Is that not God's severity? Indeed it is. A fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But now in the third place this morning, both God's goodness and severity is seen in Romans 11, verses 22 and 23. Let's go through this for a moment. Going back to our lesson text, Romans 11, verses 22 and 23. Paul said, Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity. That is, on the Jews who disbelieved on the Lord. The Lord cut them off. That's God's severity. But toward the goodness, that is, toward the Gentiles, in that God was willing and did in fact open salvation up to the Gentile world. He invited them into the kingdom of the church at the house of Cornelius. You remember in Acts 10 at the preaching of the gospel. And he commissioned his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. To go therefore and teach all nations. Matthew 28 verse 19. That's God's goodness. But then we read, But toward the goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. There's a condition. If. We must remain faithful. We must continue in the faith grounded and settled. Colossians 1.23 We must be faithful to the Lord. We can't just be saved and then say, well, I've nothing more to do. I don't really have to grow or bear fruit or be faithful. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14.15 Revelation 2.10 The Lord said to the church at Smyrna, even in the face of the fiercest of persecution." Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. There's a condition. But he concludes verse 22 of Romans 11 by saying, Otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. In other words, you're going to face the severity of God just as those Jews who were in unbelief whom God cut off. Then in verse 23 we have an example of God's goodness again. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. That is, those Jews who are in unbelief can be brought back in to God's favor again if they will turn from that unbelief and disobedience and turn back to God. Now that leads to another point I want to look at here. In the New Testament, obedience and belief and unbelief and disobedience are used interchangeably. That is, unbelief and disobedience are used interchangeably. And belief and obedience are used interchangeably. And I want to prove that with the scriptures themselves. The only way we can prove anything anyway. In John 3 verse 36. Listen to this. I'm reading from the American Standard Version. He that believeth on the Son hath eternal life, but he that obeyeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Believeth is said in contrast with obeyeth not in this sacred text here. Now, look at 1 Peter chapter 2, the same thing. Beginning at verse 6. Because it is contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be put to shame. He that believeth on him. But now here, verses 7 and 8. For you, for you, therefore, that believe is the preciousness. But for such as disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, the same was made the head of the corner and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, for they stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto they were appointed. Being disobedient here is equated with those who did not believe. Those who did not believe on the Lord. They were counted as being disobedient. And those who believe were counted as the obedient. Do we not see then the connection in the Bible? Now, in the fourth place this morning, last of all, let's consider God's severity in specific instances. 
First of all, God is severe toward the disobedient, those who never obey the gospel. Uh, there are some who have the attitude, well, you know, old John Doe over there, he's a fine fellow. He's a member of such and such club, and they do good works, and he's a good moral man who will help you in any way he can, and uh, he's just a fine fellow, an upstanding, hard worker, pays his taxes, pays his bills, and all this. He may not be religious, but he's a good man. I believe he'll be in heaven. You know, a lot of people reason like that, and a lot of people think that about themselves. Well, I'm a good old Joe, you know, and I'm Lord's not going to condemn me. I love my family. I try to do good to others. Can't say God will condemn a person like that, can you? Well, again, what does the Bible say? Let's go to 2 Thessalonians 1, beginning at verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus should be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. They know not God. What's the only way we can know God? John said, and hereby we do know that we know him if we have faith only. No, that's not what he said. First John 2, 3, And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Friends, you cannot know the Lord any other way but by faith in him and obedience to his will. And those who obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you mean to tell me just because a person isn't baptized, they're going to be condemned with everlasting destruction? Well, friends, I didn't write the Bible. I didn't inspire the words written. God did. If we have a disagreement with what the Bible says, we'll have to take that up with God because He is the one who gave these words. That those who know not God or obey not the gospel will be punished with everlasting destruction. A second category is the unfaithful. Now here I'm talking about members of the church. What about the parable of the talents and the one talent man? You know what the Lord called him in Matthew 25, 26? A wicked and slothful servant. He didn't steal that talent. He didn't lie about it. He just hid it in the ground. He didn't do anything with it. Do you mean a person will be condemned simply because of what they did not do? What does James say to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin? Hebrews 2, 3, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? What did the master of that servant say of this one tall man, Matthew 25, 30? Cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Will men suffer eternal agony because of their neglect? Yes, that's what the Lord is teaching. Now, look at Revelation 3, beginning of verse 15, the layout of sins. Here are these members of the church they felt they were so well off spiritually and right with God. But here's what the Lord said to them. He said, I know thy works that thou are neither cold nor hot, I would thy work neither cold nor hot. So then because I were lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and I have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Revelation 3, 15 17. This is what you think you are but this is what the Lord says you are. You're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. These Laodiceans were well off materially, and they prided themselves on their prosperity and their success. But the Lord tells them they better repent or else. He commands them to repent in that passage. He said to be zealous, therefore, and repent. They needed to repent. What about members of the church today? that aren't faithful, that aren't true to the Lord. Another group that God will execute severity toward are the mean, the cruel, the immoral, those in false religion. Let's turn back toward the end of the Bible, the book of Revelation. Let's look at chapter 21, verse 8, and then chapter 22 and verse number 5 and see what the Lord has to say about these. But the fearful, that's cowardly. And unbelieving, what about unbelievers? 
agnostics, atheists, and unbelievers generally. And the abominable, those who commit abominable acts toward God. And we have so much of that in society today. Filth, degradation, and abomination. God hates that. And the abominable and murderers and whoremongers. That's the fornicators, adulterers, the immoral, and sorcerers, those practicing witchcraft, and idolaters, false religionists. And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's hell fire he's talking about. Is that God's severity or no? We know it is. Now I'll turn to the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22 and verse number 15. For without, that is outside of the city of God, mentioned in verse 14. For without our dogs, he's not talking about our pet animals, dogs, or any other kind of dog, animal. He's talking about people. He calls them dogs. That's how low they were. For without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Oh, we have a lot of liars in the land today, don't we? This is where their eternal home is going to be. God wants them to repent. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Second Peter 3 9. But if man insists on continuing down that path, he will be lost eternally. What about apostates? We did mention those earlier in Hebrews 10. But let's look at another passage regarding apostates. And this time in 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning of verse 20. What is an apostate? That is once who, one who was once cleansed from the pollutions and the filth and the sin of this world by the blood of Christ, but who has turned against the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Apostle Peter declares in 2 Peter 2, beginning at verse 20, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. We have a lot of people in Mount Pleasant, Columbia, and Murray County in that category that were once members of the church and throughout Tennessee, and in fact throughout the world in this category. He goes on to say, For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, The dog is turned to his own vomit again, the south was washed, or wallowing in the mire. What a vivid picture this is here of a dog vomiting and then turning to that vomit again. That's a powerful figure regarding those who escape sin through Jesus Christ, but then they turn back into it. Then what about false teachers? God severity toward them. Let's look at 2 Peter again this time. I want to look at Portions of chapter 2, verses 1 and 3. The Bible speaks of those who bring in damnable heresies, that is, destructive heresies that destroy souls. Even denying the Lord that bought them. By bringing in these false doctrines, they deny the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who bought them with His blood. We have many in the church like that today. Bring in false doctrine and error about marriage, divorce, remarriage, about the Holy Spirit, about God's grace, about fellowship and unity, false doctrines, denying the Lord that bought them. And bring upon themselves swift destruction. That's God's severity. Verse 3, at the end of the verse, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Their damnation slumbereth not. In Galatians 1, beginning at verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him who called you to the grace of Christ and to another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. He says there is not another there in that chapter. But he goes on to say, But though we are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be a curse. As we said before, so sound now again, if any man preach any of the gospel unto you, then that ye have received, 
let him be a curse. Now, there's something noteworthy about this. You know the book of Galatians deals extensively with the Judaizing teachers. These people were members of the church. And they were going out trying to bind circumcision upon Gentile converts. They were trying, in effect, to lead Christians back under the old law. They wanted an admixture of the gospel and the law of Moses together. Someone might say, what's so terrible about that? Well, here's what's so terrible. Paul declares it right here. It results in another gospel, which is not another. It's not the true gospel when you do that. And he speaks of their fate. Those who do so, regardless of who they are, what false teaching they do teach, will be accursed. Now, friends, that's severe. That's very severe. And man needs to be warned about that, lest he face the severity of God. As we close today, which will we hear in the end? Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Matthew 25, 34. Or depart from me, I know you not, you that work iniquity. Matthew 25, 41. Or rather, excuse me, depart from me, you cursing in the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angel. In Matthew 7, beginning at verse 21, <coughs> the Lord teaches here that we must do the will of God, and even those who profess to belong to Christ, and who may apparently do many wonderful works will be ordered to depart if they do not truly obey the will of God. Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, that is, the judgment, the last day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work in it. You see, friends, just being religious is not enough. Yes, we must be members of the Lord's church and no other, but we must be faithful members of the body of Christ. This morning, we encourage those who've never obeyed the gospel by hearing and believing the gospel, Romans 10, 17, by coming to repentance, Acts 17, 30, and confessing Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Acts 8, 37, and being baptized in his name for the remission of sins, going into the water and coming up out of the water, Acts 2.38, Acts 38.39, and Acts 22.16, to do so that they may put on Christ, Galatians 3.27. Those who have done that but who have become unfaithful and turned away from the Lord and need to come back, they can be forgiven, as our lesson text indicates today. But they must repent and confess their sin, and pray God's forgiveness. If we have any here who need to respond, we encourage you to do that very thing while we stand and we sing together. If you will, just make that number 700, just a couple of pages over. 700 invitations. There's a stranger at the door. Let
Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy high and holy name. Help us as we partake of this fruit of the vine to remember your son's death on the cross and his blood that he shed for us. Help us to partake of this fruit of the vine and reverence your son, which represents his blood. In your son's name we pray, amen. amen. Now we will have the offering. <clears throat> Our dear Heavenly Father, help us to be of humble and thankful hearts toward Thee through Thy Son, for every good and perfect gift, Father, especially the gift of Thy Son and salvation. But Father, there are so many bountiful blessings that Thou hast freely bestowed upon us. Father, help us to give back in a good and cheerful heart and sacrificially as we've been prospered to thee and to thy church and to purpose as we give. We pray thy will be done in Christ. here. Thank you for Jesus Christ our Savior, for his word, for his death, his burial, his resurrection, for the worship service today. 
We pray that you'll continue to bless us in all things. Go with us, guard, guide, and direct us, and bring us back to the next appointed time. Christ, then we pray. Amen. Amen.